If you'd like a PDF copy of the presentation I use in this lecture or video, please sign up for my newsletter. You can do that by going to my website, compassionatelearning.net, or sending me a message through Instagram, which is at compassionate learning. <laughs> oh, that is pretty clever. That's <laughs> pretty clever. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, what else? Um, also, if you sign up for my newsletter, you'll be notified of all the goodies that I offer to help you pass the MBLEX exam, including my $5 prep class, which I'll be offering once a month. Um, and there's also lots of other announcements that will be happening through the newsletter. Thanks for your time. Today we're going to do medical terminology. And uh, medical terminology is vast. Like we could easily spend three classes, four classes, six hours, eight hours covering medical terminology. But I've done my best to just select the stuff that I think is most relevant to you <clears throat> and uh, specifically relevant to you uh, pertaining to the MBLEX questions. So you should get the video panel up. So I can see you guys. All right, so we're gonna just jump in and start doing this. And okay, learning the different parts of a medical term unlocks the meaning of the term, even if you have no context, even if you've never seen the word and don't really know the context in which it's applied medically. Uh, what you look for is the suffix at the end first. That's the most helpful part. So if it ends in something like gram or graphy or scope or scopy or logi, then you know that it is respectively a record, the study of an instrument. And you start your sentence um, defining the term that way, uh, decoding the term that way. So, so electrocardio, this is two, this is three words. Electro is one, which means electricity. Cardio is a second, which means heart. And then gram is the third. So you would start by saying, by saying record of the electricity of the heart like that, rather than electrical heart record, because it'll make more sense to you if you put the last word, the suffix first, record of the electricity of the heart. Biology, logi meaning the study of, and that is the study of life. Histo, uh, histology, that's tissues, so that's the study of tissues. Gastro, entero, that's stomach and intestines, um, or digestive tract. Logi, the study of the digestive tract. Scope, uh, scope is an instrument to see. Endo is inside, so uh, uh, an instrument to see inside. Endoscopy is the process of seeing inside. Uh, okay. You guys like stop and ask me to clarify anything that you need. Okay. So we just looked at the suffix. That's the part that comes at the end, right? That's really important. Uh, every word has a root. And in some of the words we just saw, the roots were words such as cardio, bio, histo. Uh, roots that are really familiar to us as um, body workers are things like myo or mice for muscle, and then neuro for nerve, osteo for bone, dermo for skin. Uh, okay, so there's roots, and then there, there'll be a suffix added to that, like the root bio and the suffix logi, the study of life, the root histo, and logi, the study, histology, the study of tissues. Some of them will use prefixes. Prefixes that are familiar to us as body workers are things like ab or ab, which means away from. So that's abduct, to conduct or to go away. Ad, like ad as an adduct, to conduct toward, ad toward, duct, a passageway. Uh, so we're going to get into suffixes and we're going to get into some prefixes. Combining vowel connect roots, uh, a combining vowel, a combining vowel connects the roots to other roots and roots to suffixes. So here the root gastro, the root gastro is connected to a second root entero or enter. Gaster and enter. 
it's connected by the combining vowel O. So instead of gastroenteritis, it's gastroenteritis, right? Instead of elector, instead of elector cardiogram, it's electrocardiogram, right? Gastroentero electrocardio. Um, sometimes words will have will have a combining vowel that will join the root and uh, the suffix. I think o and endo might be one, uh, but Anyway, that, that's less important because really the combining vowels, once you get a feel for them, you'll recognize them as, as just something that joins a couple of words. What's really important is recognizing the root, the suffix, the prefix. And then a term that, that we use sometimes uh, when talking about medical terminology is combining form. So that is the form of the word when it's ready to be combined with a suffix or with a prefix. So um, for, for abdomen, the combining form would be abdomino. For um, elector or electra, the combining form would be electro, right? For, uh, for gaster or enter, the combining forms would be gastro and enter, entero. It's like the ready to be, ready to be suffixed or prefixed form of the word. Uh, general guidelines, like I said, always start at the end. If there's a suffix, you read the suffix first, read the suffix first. Uh, if, the if the suffix starts with a vowel, like the word itis, which means inflammation, the combining vowel is usually dropped. So we don't say gastro-itis, we just say gastritis. Um, Yeah, combining vowels are almost always retained, even if the root word begins with a vowel, uh, like gaster o enter. E is a vowel in enter. Gastro enter itis. Gastro enter itis. Okay. Any questions about that? It's just some, something for you to keep in mind as we enter into the, the study of medical terminology. Okay, some examples of combining forms. I gave you a few already, but some examples are adin plus o, adeno, which refers to, to a gland, right? So adeno hypothesis. Adeno is the combining form of, of adin, right? Arthro is the combining form of arthr, of arthr. This is a silly saying that, but no, I don't feel silly. I feel stupid saying that. All right, anyway, so arthro is the combining form of arthur, right? And bio is the combining form of bi, right? Life. Carcino is the combining form of carson for cancer. Cardio, cephalo, cerebro. Cysto, cyto, uh, you know, basically this, we're just trying to build our vocabulary here, right? So cysto um, means bladder or urinary bladder, cysto. And then cyte means cell. So cysto refers to urinary bladder uh, and then cyto refers to a cell. Uh, dermato, skin, also called dermo, derm or dermat. And then electro, electricity. Uh, erythro for red. Gaster, gastro for stomach, nos, noso for knowledge. Gynec and gynaco for female, hemat, hemato for blood, chemo for blood, hepato for liver. Uh, I think that's all I had the patients to go into. Yeah, okay. So um, some examples, just some quick examples of longer words and their combining forms uh, are abdomino, abdominal. And right, so abdomen, abdominal, AL means pertaining to or related or speaking of or related to. Uh, abduct, ab away, duct passageway. Adduct, add toward, duct passageway. Abdominopelvic, abdominocentesis, abduction, adduction. Um, Okay, 
So when, when we uh, study the body and think about injury and pain and stress and how to treat people, we think a lot about the layers of the body. We think about the skin and the fascia, the vasculature, the nerves, the muscles, the tendons, the ligaments, joint capsules, bones. Sometimes we need to think about the marrow. Um, and we think about the internal organs too, and all of those have layers, right? There's uh, a medulla and a cord. There's a medulla on the inside and a cortex on the outside. And sometimes there's medical terminology that, that uh, denotes relationships like the ad adrenal glands ad renal are ad so toward the renal or kidneys toward the kidneys on top of the kidneys so muscles are a fine place for us for us to start uh, in terms of looking at specific examples in the body and and they're also really good for us to go over because muscles have so many terms right like sarcolemma myofibrils sarcomere like what are all these things we get really lost and no matter how many times we see these abstractions of the bodies that we're working on still it's always it still it always could be a little bit clearer uh, so i thought it would be good to go over these um, so prefixes myo meaning muscle mice meaning muscle uh, don't forget or recall that mice myo are named after um, the, I think it's the Latin, maybe the Greek, the Latin meaning mouse. So muscles resemble uh, mice underneath the skin. And that's what the ancients, at least in that part of the world, thought they looked like. Um, and then sarco refers to flesh. So sometimes muscles will be referred to as sarco or parts will be referred to by sarco and sometimes they'll be referred to by myo or mice. Uh, they are basically the same. The one exception is where you see um, the word oma as in um, that word sarcoma, right? So oma means tumor, usually sometimes cancer, sometimes not. And in this case, sarcoma means a tumor of the flesh. In, in that context, they mean... Uh, they mean like connective tissue as part as the flesh. So it's a tumor of the connective tissue. That can be the fascia, it can be the bone, it can be the blood. Uh, we'll, we'll look at that. That'll come up again later. But uh, and the stuff that's like not that I'm pretty sure is um, the stuff that I'm pretty sure is less relevant for you. I'm not going to wait as much as the stuff that I think it might be more relevant for you. Like I know you're going to see the word myofibril or myofilament. I know you're going to see that at some point. And my goal is just to help reduce the chances of confusion when you see that. <laughs> so, uh, okay. So here's some of the more confusing, well, here, here are some of the words which I experience as confusing. I don't know about you. When combined with myo and sarco. So there's lemma, like sarco lemma. Lemma means sheath or membrane around the muscle or around the flesh. Fibrils, like it sounds, thank goodness, refers to fiber or a filament, like muscle fibers, myofibrils. Mir is a segment or a part, the sarcomere. Uh, when you see mir, I want you to think of a train, like with train cars that are stacked end to end to end, or you can think of a bunch of cars in traffic end to end to end, because that's how sarcomeres are, are stacked. Uh, bumper to bumper. Filament. It means thread-like. Most of us know what a filament looks like, but um, it means thread-like. Uh, okay, with smooth and cardiac muscle, you'll sometimes see the term myocyte, right? So myo means muscle and site means cell. So that's a muscle cell, but it, it's only used to refer to smooth muscle and cardiac muscle. Uh, I just wanted to show you guys what a lemma looks like. So this is a... I forget if this is a corn husk or, or if it's, a, I forget if this is an ear of corn or if it's um, some kind of uh, grain. But in, in either case, a corn is a grain, but um, the outside is wrapped by, um, by a sheath or a membrane, which is called the lemma. So this whole thing here is the lemma. Uh, okay, and now, and here's the sheath of the, of the muscle, right? The sarcolemma. 
So now it's time to try to put some of the words in the context of the actual muscle diagrams. The problem that I always have is that the diagrams are pretty abstract. Try to visualize these in your forearm or bicep or in the body somewhere. So what we're, what we're looking at here is a muscle cell. This whole thing is one muscle cell. This is a muscle cell. And this is part of a muscle cell called the myofibril or the myofiber. We'll, we'll look at the myofibril in, in a minute. Uh, so the, the muscle cell is the same as the muscle fiber. A muscle cell is sometimes referred to as fiber of muscle, a muscle fiber. It's also called a sarcomere, and it's also called a myofiber or myofibril. No, fibril? No, it's also called a myofiber as well as a muscle fiber. Uh, okay, one myofiber, one muscle fiber has many myofibrils. So threads inside of the fiber. The fiber is made of many fine threads. The fiber is made of fibrils. Uh, the muscle cell has a cell wall or a wrapping. The cell wall is just like any other cell to contain it. And inside the cell are all the same features that you, you would expect from many other cells, including nucleus or nuclei. Uh, and there are also retinaculae or, ret or many retinaculums. Uh, you'll find mitochondria and all kinds of other organelles. Um, speak up if any of that is unclear. All right. So now here's another like exact same model, just different drawing, right? So you have this, this whole muscle fiber and inside you have myofibrils. And then what I wanted to show you from this, from this diagram is the smaller blown up version of the myofibril. So if we take out one myofibril and we look at it closely, we blow it up, what we see are um, a whole bunch of like super confusing bullshits. Uh, so, so you, get, you gotta remember the, sarco, the sarcomere you gotta remember the sarcomere, <clears throat> and you gotta remember um, the myosin filaments and the actin filaments. And you may have to know I bands, A bands, uh, Z discs, H zones, and Z discs. But we'll we'll get to those a little bit more specifically later. So for now, we're just we're looking at how the words fit together, like sarco and mir, sarco and plasmic, right? Um, filament as in myofilaments, right? Uh, so you can understand the differences between like filaments and fibrils and fibers, right? And keep those, that hierarchy in place. So uh, a sarcomere is uh, a segment of the muscle. And the segment that we're looking at is right here. This is one segment here. And then next to it, there's another segment. Let's say this is in front, and then behind it, there's another segment. So it's three segments, one, two, and three. So they're, they're bumper to bumper like cars. And then, yeah, sarcomere. I mean, I should, um, did I give you, uh, did we define mirror? Mirror should mean uh, segment, I think. Mirror means segment, segment. Uh, so a segment of the sarco, a segment of the muscle, a segment of the flesh. Uh, okay, and then making up the part of the sarcomere, making up the sarcomere are filaments, many, many filaments together, and some are thick and some are thinner. The ones that are thicker are made of myosin, and the ones that are thinner are made of actin, made of or referred to as actin. Anyway, the ones that are thinner are the actin filaments, the ones that are thicker are the myosin filaments. So they are called collectively myofilaments. The actin and the myosin filaments are myofilaments. 
myofilaments are the actin, thin filaments, and the myosin thick filaments. The way that I remember, how are you gonna remember which one is thin and which one is thick? Well, alphabetical works for me. Okay, sorry, my, my microphone cycled there for a second. Josh, can you give me a thumbs up? Is my sound working okay? Okay, great, thank you. So uh, yeah, so myo, mice, sarco. Now, let's drill that just one more time because you know what, repetition is the mother of learning. You, you can hate on me, but I'm just trying to help. Okay, lemma, like sarco lemma sheath or membrane, fibril like fiber or filament. So myofibril, mirror, segment or part, sarcomere, filament, which means thread-like. Yeah, there's fibrils, there's fibers, fibrils and filaments. Yeah, there's, there's repetition there. One mu muscle cell, one muscle cell is referred to as uh, a sarcomere. It's also a muscle fiber or a myofiber. Inside of the myofiber, muscle fiber, sarcomere, there are many, many, many myofibrils. Inside the myofiber, there's many myofibrils. The myofibrils are made up of uh, myofilaments, thick myosin filaments, thin actin filaments. And all of these filaments are broken down into sections of, of car-like end-to-end sections called sarcomeres. You know, they can't, they can't call it like a myomere, right, to make it consistent. Uh, they got to switch it up on you a little bit. Uh, okay, I'm sure there's, there's a reason for that, by the way, that they're, that they're favoring sarco over myo, but it's not, it's not important. Okay, so... Um, the direction of the movement of muscle fibers, we really should um, at least have some idea of, of what it means when a muscle in the leg is, is named rectus, very similar to the same as a muscle in the abdomen. And that's when the fascicles are parallel to the long axis of the body or parallel to the limb. So for the leg, for the leg, it's if this is the femur, it's running the same direction as the femur, right? The axis of the limb. For the rectus abdominis, it's running along the long axis of the body. Uh, transverse meaning the fascicles are perpendicular to the long axis of the body or the limb. So the transversus abdominis goes this way. Uh, oblique means that the fascicles are at, at an angle to the long axis of the body or limb. So you have the internal obliques and then you have the external obliques, right? The internal are pointing toward the inside and the external are, point, are radiating up toward the outside. Uh, and then there's size, right? The maximus is the large, the minimus is the small, the medius is the medium, the longest is the long, the brevis is the short. Uh, so, and origin and insertion, origin and insertion is always a little confusing for me, but a good definition of it is that the origin does not move. So, um, um, and then the insertion is, is the end of the muscle that moves. So uh, for, the, um, for the biceps brachii, for example, it can be, this is a great example of a muscle that's a little origin and insertion that's a little confusing because it originates here, but the biceps, the biceps muscle does do a little bit of flexion, a little bit of flexion, right? But its main function is to move the forearm, right? So this is the end that moves, and this is the end that doesn't move. So it's origin and insertion. Uh, personally, I don't think origin and insertion are very useful to think about unless you're like an anatomist or something like an anatomist. Okay, and then the action is um, how or what it moves. Um, keep going. So biceps means two origins, triceps means three, and quadriceps means four origins. 
I'm going to take 15 seconds to ask you for a donation. If this video helps you, please say thank you by sending a donation using one of the links in the description. Your helping to support me financially makes an enormous difference to my morale and frees me up from doing other jobs so I can do this more. Thank you. Now on with the video. All right, we're moving on now away from muscles. So some of the words that uh, you probably already have well underhand, but need, um, I'd like to remind you of are the body cavities. So the cranial cavity, the cranial cavity is the one that houses the skull, it's the cranium, the thoracic cavity. The thoracic cavity is pretty big. It goes from the top dome of the lung down to the bottom of the rib cage. The abdominal uh, cavity goes from the bottom of the rib cage down to the pelvis. So that's like the soft fleshy part. This is also called the loin or the lapero or the lapper. And then there's the pelvic cavity. The pelvic cavity houses the reproductive organs and part of the digestive tract and the urinary tract. Uh, divisions of the back, right? Cervical for the neck, thoracic for the mid back and lumbar for the lower back, sacral for the sacrum, coccygeal for the coccyx. Patients will say to you all the time, I have back pain, and what they mean is pain somewhere in the thoracic region. Uh, colloquial, uh, I'll just say like colloquially or you know, commonly, when people, when doctors say back pain or PTs or whoever, massage therapists say back pain, they mean lumbar pain. But uh, it can also include lumbar as well as sacral or coccygeal area pain. Uh, okay, planes of the body. Um, this is this is always confusing to me, and I think the best way to memorize the planes is just to put things in alphabetical order. And there, and luckily, both front and back letters F and B are in the first third of the alphabet. Left and right letters L and R are in the middle third of the alphabet, and then up down, well not down, but up, top and bottom they're in the latter third of the alphabet, right? So except for down, this works for the most part, right? So front and back is the first part and the first plane in the first third of the alphabet is frontal. Left and right is in the middle third of the alphabet and the next word alphabetically is sagittal. And then up, down or top, upper top, uh, the next word that correlates to the word transverse, the latter third of the alphabet. So the frontal plane divides the body into the front and back, divides the body into the front and back, right? So if something comes from your front, usually you'd think it's coming from this way, but that's actually the sagittal plane, right? So that's not reliable. So the frontal plane divides the body this way into the front and back. So that is the big blue one here frontal plane here's the front of the body here's the back of the body and this would also work if if you used anterior and posterior if you used anterior here uh, and then um superior here we're just just kind of lucky up top superior uh okay and then the sagittal plane sagittal plane divides the body into the left and the right so this red one here is the sagittal plane dividing the body into the left side and the right side. They, they give you another sagittal plane or a variation on the sagittal plane called the parasagittal plane. And then the transverse plane divides the body into top and bottom or divides it up and down. So here's the transverse plane, this green one, dividing the body into top and bottom, up and down, superior and inferior. So what I recommend is that is that when you when you see a question like which plane regarding the planes is that you first write this out right front back left right up down or top bottom or superior inferior and then write down frontal sagittal transverse in order and match them up so that you can just have that as a reference. Okay, um, I'm gonna say each one of these combining forms. If you were gonna zone out, now would be the time. <laughs> So abdomen, abdomen, abdomino for abdomen, as in abdominal, anterior, antero for front as in anterior, cervico as in neck, cervical, chondro 
meaning cartilage, as in chondriac, hypochondriac. Coxid, coxigo, coxigo, as in coccyx, as in coxygeal. Cranio, as in skull, craniotomy, cranium, hepato, liver, hepatitis, lateral, side, lateral, lumbo, waist, loin, or back, as in lumbar, pelvo, pelvis, pelvic, peritoneo, peritoneum, the peritoneum, peritoneal, pleuro, pleura, the lungs, pleuritis, Postero, behind or back, posterior. Sacro, sacrum, sacral. Spino, spine or backbone, spinal. Thoraco, chest or thorax. Thoracic, vertebro, vertebra, vertebral. Vertebra or vertebral. Uh, okay, so we just did a bunch of like combining words. We did some... Uh, some roots and uh, prefixes pertaining to uh, muscle anatomy. Uh, we got organized with uh, the different planes of the body, uh, which is less like, it's less um, word breakdown and it's more just words that you have to know, but it's in the realm of medical terminology. So now we're gonna look at some specific suffixes how they're the definition of them and then how they're used. So it's the suffix in the first column, second column is what it means, the definition. And the third column is an example. Uh, so we have a lot to go through. So just speak up if something is really unclear, but don't speak up if it's if, if you want to say, oh yeah, my aunt had that, or uh, you know, it kind of sounds like I think maybe, kind of sort of, maybe this, maybe that. No, don't do that. Just be like. If you're totally confused why neuralgia refers to nerves rather than, um, I don't know, the kidneys or something or something else, uh, please please speak up if it's that level of confusion. Okay, alga. So uh, alga goes on the end of a word. Alga means pain. Arthur, arthralgia. So joint pain. My from myo or my, myalgia from muscle pain. Neur from neuro or nerve. Neuralgia, nerve pain. Emia, meaning blood. Ischemia is a deficiency of blood. Hyperemia is an increase or kind of an excess of blood. A or an emia is not enough blood or without, literally without blood. Uremia is urine plus blood, blood in the urine. Ea is a condition or a disease, so pneumonia a lung condition or a disease of the lungs. Itis is inflammation, really important for us. Tendonitis, inflammation of the tendons. Colitis, inflammation of the col or the colon. Bronchitis, inflammation, inflammation of the bronchi, uh, the small parts of the lungs. Neuritis, infl inflammation of the nerves. Uh, oma, oma means mass or tumor. For myoma, that's a tumor of the muscles, often benign. Uh, for hematoma, that's a mass of blood. For carcinoma, that's a tumor that is cancerous. Uh, osis. Osis is very, very important for us. I put A, B, N, I put abnormal because uh, I wanted to save space. Okay, nephrosis, that's a kidney abnormality. Necrosis is an abnormality, ab abnormal death or the death of cells or the death of tissues. Uh, leukocytosis, leukocyte. Those are white blood cells. So this is an increase in white blood cells. Uh, that's normal. You get a splinter, there's an increase in white blood cells. You get an infection, there's an increase in white blood cells. Tendonitis. Uh, I'm sorry, I meant to, to put osis. Tendinosis. So this is something that that like clinical people like want to really be specific. Sometimes they refer to inflammation in the tendons as tendinosis rather than tendonitis because the inflammatory condition is different from what they think should be a, a strict, strictly speaking, itis. Ask those people what their success rate is at tendinosis. Treat it. Don't ex don't like look too closely at it. Um, typhosis. 
Don't look too closely at the word, look at the patient. Hyphosis. Think of this as an abnormal curve of the thoracic spine, lordosis. Think of this as an abnormal curve of the lumbar spine. Can kyphosis and lordosis be normal? Yes, they can. It becomes abnormal beyond a certain degree. So you'll see like specific numbers, like the number I've seen for lordosis is greater than 45 degrees of a curve in the lumbar spine is considered pathogenic lordosis or, or abnormal lordosis. Generally on the test, um, well, on the questions that I've seen, which, which imitate the test questions, those questions use phrases like exaggerated thoracic kyphosis. They make it, it kind of hits you over the head with it. But keep in mind when, when you hear kyphosis, it means an uh, outward curving uh, of the thoracic spine. Lordosis means an inward curving of the lumbar spine. There's also a lordosis in the cervical spine, but very few people refer to it that way. Okay, pathy. Pathy means disease condition. Right, so um, you don't always see it in re referring to a disease. Sometimes you see it in reference to a cure as in homeopathy or osteopathy or allopathy. So myopathy means a muscle or muscles disease. Um, cardiomyopathy, heart muscle disease. Nephropathy means a kidney, di kidney disease. Homeopathy means a similar disease. So uh, it doesn't actually mean similar disease. It means similar to the disease, similar to the disease condition, similar to the discomfort. So the idea with homeopathy is that you use, let's say, um, an allergen like pollen. You use the allergen that causes the disease or the discomfort in very small amounts in order to uh, decrease the effect of the disease or the, or the discomfort. Um, so uh, and that is the opposite of that. That's the opposite approach of allopathy, which means opposite of disease. So with homeopathy, they would give you a small amount of the same thing that causes the disease in order to cure you of it. Keep in mind, I'm not a homeopath. I'm simplifying and I'm not doing the, 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 the art justice. Uh, in allopathy, they would do the opposite of the disease. So if something's growing in you, they cut it out right, uh, or they poison it. They do the opposite of the disease condition, treating a disease with its opposite as is often done in Western medicine. Um, if something is multiplying in you, they kill it. Uh, okay, and then osteopathy is a disease, means literally disease of the bones, uh, but really that's the literal meaning, but really a better definition is a system of medicine that stresses healing, through the manipulation of body parts while also using many standard medical practices such as surgery and drugs, meaning osteopaths are, uh, it's within their scope of practice to do certain kinds of invasive procedures, including surgeries and to administer um, pharmaceuticals. Okay, onward with the suffixes. Uh, how many more suffixes do we have? We have two more pages. Okay, so ectomy is the removal or resection or excision, removal, resection, or excision, like a discectomy where you, re where you remove or you excise part of the disc, or a laminectomy where you remove part of the, the, vertebr the vertebrae, part of the bone, uh, commonly called the lamina groove, but it includes the posterior um, uh, somebody help me out here. I always mix up the processes. There's the transverse processes and then there's the spinous process. Yeah. They remove the spinous process and part of the bone that's around it. So um, laminectomy, excision of the, of the spinous process, excision of the lamina section of the vertebra. Uh, and then there's gram, which is record, uh, and graphy, which is the process of making a record, the process of Record. So a mammogram is a record of a mammography, and a mammography records the breast tissue during a mammogram. Same for electrocardiogram, electrocardiography. Electrocardiography is the process where they record the electrical, the electricity of the heart, and an electrocardiogram is the record of the electricity of someone's heart. Lysis means separation or breakdown or splitting into or cleaving. 
Uh, cleaving means cutting, right? Lysis, cutting. Hemolysis just means red blood cell breakdown. Uh, but in general, lysis, in, as, it, as it's applied, um, in general, I think lysis is most important for us as, to, as it's applied to any kind of cell membrane splitting uh, or cell dividing. Rhea, this one is used a lot, uh, diarrhea, amenorrhea. Um, okay, so rhea means flow or discharge. And dia means across or through. So it's literally through flowing or flowing through. It's going like the water is going right through the person. The feces and water are going right through the person, flowing through. Uh, meno means menstrual or menses. And rhea means flow. So menstrual flow. A means no or, or uh, opposite of. No, it just means no or without. So amenorrhea means no menstrual flow or without menstrual flow. Dis means painful or abnormal dysfunction. Di, uh, so dysmenorrhea is painful menstrual flow. And the next few suffixes all mean pertaining to. So al or eel mean pertaining to, that's peritoneal or inguinal. Uh, AR like vascular, ARY like pulmonary or axillary, IC like chronic or pelvic. Um, oh, is that all the uh, is that all the pertaining tos? Yeah. Okay. Uh, plasty is a form of surgical repair. Excuse me, rhinoplasty where they repair structures in in the nose. Angioplasty, where they repair the blood vessels. Angio means vessel. Often angioplasty, I think, refers to, to arteries, but it doesn't matter. Um, angioplasty is the repair of some kind of blood vessel. Scopy or scopy is the process of visual examination. The weird, like, random capitalization is something that, um, that word processing programs like Google Docs do it's hard to control all right scopy process of visual examination so arthroscopy is the process of visualizing the joints looking inside the joints uh laparoscopy lapro refers to the loins the soft part between the ribs and the pelvic bones so that's the abdomen so that's looking inside the abdomen uh stomy means opening, so colostomy, that's creating an opening in the colon, tracheostomy, that's creating an opening in the trachea. Uh, all right, so we did suffixes, which comes at the end. Remember, when you see a suffix, begin your definition, begin your translation with the suffix first, right? So rhinoplasty would be repair of the nose, right? Uh, colostomy, would be an opening in the colon. And now prefixes. So prefixes go at the beginning of the word, suffixes go at the end of the word. A or an, I'm just gonna, gonna uh, cruise through these. There's only one slide and then we'll do like a bunch of questions, a bunch of drilling. Uh, so A and an mean not or without, like anemia, not, not enough blood or without blood. Ab means away from, away from, usually away from the center. So abduct to conduct away from the center or abnormal, away from normal. AD or ad means toward, toward the center or near. So that's ad renal, near the kidneys or on top of the kidneys and then adduct, adduct, uh, toward, conducting toward. Anti means before, antepartum, I'm sorry, anta, not anti. There's anta here. There's anta and anti or anti. So anta, like antepartum before birth. And there's anti or anti, meaning antibody, antibody. So antibody and antibiotic, I listen here, right? So antibody means a body that works against something, literally, not literally, but the implication is infections. It works against infections. Antibiotic is uh, a body that works against 
Oh, no, no. So bio means life. Anti means against, against life. And ik means more or less, more or less of or pertaining to antibiotic. Uh, by. Yeah, okay, before we move on, I just want to point out that some things are implied in definitions uh, and it can be confusing, like, um, like dialysis is one of those words. We'll get to that in a minute. Antibody is one of those words. So antibody means a body working against, but it's implied, but the word infection or foreigner is implied. And then uh, bi means bilateral or two sides, lateral means sides. Brady means slow, like bradycardia, and then the opposite of that is tachy, tachycardia, rapid heartbeat. Con, very important for us, is congenital, so that's uh, with reproduction. And concentric means with the center or toward the center, or contraction, with contraction. Dia means through or complete, so diarrhea we saw already, so this is... Uh, Dia is, is through, and rhea is flowing. So this is flowing through or through flowing. Now, dialysis means through splitting. So, and this is another thing that's implied, is that the thing that is implied is the filling up of water in, in, the, bo in the body that is then pulled out and uh, in, in the pulling out, you're separating the water from the body. You're splitting the water away from the body and it's coming out, it's going through the body. Okay, so what time is it now? So that is it for, okay, 51, about, about we did that for about 45 minutes. Okay, um, so let's do some drilling now. Uh, that, that was a lot of just like, you know, listening and listening and listening. Do you guys want to take a break now? Yeah. Okay. If there are any objections to taking a break now, please speak up. Going once, going twice, going three times. Okay. Let's take a 10 minute break. Come back at uh, or 11 minute break. Come back at, come back at 702 EST. Yes. Come back at 7.02 EST. So I'll see yes. you guys in a minute. Pause. Okay. And now we're recording. Okay. Um, uh, if you may have or may not have heard this term, yes, yeah, Shardy, actually, I'm going to mute you. Okay, you may or may not have heard this term, electromyogram or electromyography. So, electro and myo, can you guys tell me what those two mean to start with? Electro? Electricity. And then myo? Nothing. Muscle. Muscle, right. And then electro myo, let's go with gram. What does gram mean? Record? A record of, yeah. So what's the full translation? Remember, start with the suffix, the gram end part first. Electromyogram. Electromyogram? <clears throat> uh-huh. So what's the translation? So that would be a record, and then, uh -huh. a, a record of? A record of electricity? Electricity where? Electro and myo. So electricity where? In the muscle. In the muscle, that's right. So an electromyogram is where they, they hook up through inserting needles into the muscles and they test the conductivity. They test the firing of the muscle. They measure the amount of electricity going through the muscle. Very painful. Okay, um, how, about, um, how about chondro? Does anyone remember the meaning mm. of the word chondro? No, no one remembers chondro. Ooh, not good. Okay. Um, 
big pieces of the body that we have to know. Tondro is one of them. Osteo is another. Osteo surrounds the chondro. The chondro connects and buffers the osteo. The myo attaches to the osteo. Um, it was the cartilage, wasn't it? The chondro, I'm sorry. The chondro is cartilage. That's right. Okay. That's right. Now, mm -hmm. now knowing what, what we know about, about words with origins in Latin or Greek, et cetera, knowing what we know about word breakdowns, word origins, um, mm -hmm. What would you say, Marcos, what would you say then is, is the closest definition or the closest nature of the word mal, M-A-L, um, just very broadly speaking? Mal, I, uh, I don't know why. Um, but, uh, it's also used in, used in the word malevolent or mal maleficent man. compared to benevolent or beneficent. Yeah, I would have to. I'm gonna have to brush up on those just to memorize. Okay, male, male versus bene. Can you think about? Can you discern? Oh, it that way? yeah. I mean, male is more like not good for you, right? Like, like bad. Not good. Right? That's right. Yeah, that's right. So if you have chondro mal, chondro right. mal asia, chondro malasia, what do you think is the the basic gist of chondro malasia? Um, like cartilage not going bad. <laughs> Like cartilage that. going bad yeah, yeah yeah cartilage going bad yeah sure so i'll spell it out just so you guys have seen it um so chondro malatia okay so you focus in on these words chondro and mal um i'm sure asia means something like pertaining to uh, or pathogenic or something like that. But chondromalacia for sure is a, a badness of the a badness of the uh, the connective tissue. Uh, so now how do I stop share? Oh here it is. Okay. All right. I uh, can't show you guys everything because you're too smart to begin with. I'm not being sarcastic about that. You guys are pretty learned. Okay, so from chondro, let's go now to osteo. So um, remember that the word site means cell, right? C-Y-T, C-Y-T. So if you have an osteocyte, what is that? Osteocyte. Bone spur or something, right? That is, that is a bone spur, yes. But it's not, it doesn't translate literally as a spur, right? So osteo meaning bone. Mm. Bone. Right, and then site meaning cell. The literal translation would be a bone cell, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now let's go to fight. Osteophyte. Uh, osteophyte is the correct term for a bone spur. Um, so uh, osteocyte. I'm sorry, I misspoke. I did, I just didn't catch it. Osteocyte is not. Um, a bone spur. Uh, if you want to analyze any word, by the way, you look up word breakdown, osteophyte. So osteo is bone, and then phyte or phyte is growth. So osteocyte, osteo. This is not that helpful. Osteocyte. Right, compared to osteophyte which means a bone spur or literally a bone growth. And if you have the breakdown of cartilage or if you have like a bad situation with the cartilage in between the joints. So if you, if you have the breakdown of cartilage between the bones, cartilage and the joints, a lot of times what happens is there's a bone growth that happens as the result of that process. The bones rub against each other and then there's some inflammation and the inflammation has stuff in it like, um, like minerals and then those start to deposit. And then there's a reaction with the bone cells, the osteocytes, and they start to build up growth in that spot, a bone spur, a bone growth. Okay, let's look at, um, 
um, erythro. Who remembers what erythro means? It's, it's literally a color. Erythro means red, red, right? In reference to red blood cells. So then erythro, erythrocyte, C-Y-T-E, an erythrocyte would be what? Red cells. Red cells, literally, red cells. And this is one thing that's implied is that it's a red blood cell, right? Mm -hmm. And now how about leuco? Leuco also is a color. White. White, that's correct. White. And then a leukocyte would be what? White literally. blood cell. Yes, it would be a white blood cell. But Chardet, what part what part is implied? White cell. What do you mean? One of these words, white blood cell, mm -hmm. is not is not in the literal translation of leukocyte. It's not part. If you break the, the word down, it translates as white awesome. and then and then cell. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. this word blood is implied. Right. Yes. Um, okay, how about um, how about uh, this word, cyst? So cyst or like cysto. That, Does uh, that refer? Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Is that um, urine? Uh, urine is actually um, uh, ur. Oh. Or yeah, yeah. But but cyst is related to urine because it's the bladder. Oh, there you go. Right. So um, let's say that you have a, you want to take a look or you, or you want to visualize mm -hmm. inside the bladder. How would you say that? How would you, what would you call that process? So the process of visualizing is called what? Go. Scope. Scope. Yes. Scope is, uh, scope is the, um, yes. Okay. Scope's a good place to start. Scope. Okay. And how would you combine that with cyst for bladder? So you want to visualize the bladder. You want to scope the bladder. If you're going to make one word out of that. Where would you put cyst in the front or in the back? Would it be sift scope or would it be scope cyst like that? Which one? Scope cyst. Scope cyst sounds better because there's like this little kind of break between them mm -hmm. provided by the puh sound, but no, it's actually cyst. And then we use this vowel between them. So cystoscope, cystoscopy. Cystoscopy. Uh -huh. So the process of visualizing. What is this uh, letter there? This vowel that I bolded. What is that vowel called? It's joining this root. It's joining the the root cyst with the prefix with the suffix scopy. What is this vowel called here? Called a combining vowel. Combining vowel. So cyst O is bladder with a combining vowel. What do you get when you combine a root word plus a combining vowel? What does that equal? Combining form. That's the form of the word that's ready to be combined. So cysto is ready to be combined with scope or cystoscope, cystoscopy. All right, let's see. Um, let's see. Uh, 
I like you guys, so it's not, I'm not going to call it torture. I'm going to call it building character. So how can I best help you build character? Um, how about uh, we go from fiber? How about we go from, um, we organize fibril filaments and fiber. So these are all attached by, these are all preceded by the word myo, which I'm intentionally not putting up there because it would make it clearer for you. So which one is largest? Which one is smallest and which one is in the middle? Is the myofibril the largest or is the myofilament the largest? Is the myofiber the largest? Which one? Filament. No, filament is the smallest. But now, Charday, because of the mistake you made, you are one step closer to remembering that. So which one is the is the biggest, Charday, do you think? I, oh. Everyone whose name is Charday. <laughs> <laughs> which one which one do you think is is the biggest? Not so it's not filament. Right. Which one do you think it is? And you said filament is the smallest, correct? Filament is the smallest. That's right. That's right. So I'm going to go with fiber. Fiber is the largest. That's right. That is right. Let's see. How do I do a check mark? Yeah. Fiber is the biggest. OK, so that's the biggest. And filament is the smallest. So serious question, where does that put fibril in the, in the hierarchy? In the middle, that's right. So fiber, <coughs> fibril, and filament. So can you give me the um, the prefix? Can you just say the, not the prefix, can you say the root word with each of these so we can close this out? It was myofiber. That's my a myofiber. Mm -hmm. Myofibril. And my myofibril. And myofilament, that's right. That's right. What's the difference between uh, myo and sarco? What's like the practical difference clinically? If you hear the word myo or sarco, Nothing. what's it basically the same thing, basically the same. They both refer to, usually they refer to the muscles, but sarco has an additional like potential meaning. And what can that mean, or what can that refer to? Was it the sacrum? Uh, no, the sacrum is a uh, sacral, like that. And this is sarco, like that. It's like flesh in general. Flesh in general, right. And specifically, connective tissue which some people will some people will will include uh, fascia bone blood right mm -hmm. uh, but really specifically in terms of the oma <laughs> specifically in terms of the oma so sarcoma refers to a tumor, usually cancerous, of the fascia, bone, or blood. All right, and then a sarcolemma. What is that? Does anyone remember sarcolemma? Do you remember what the word lemma means? Lemma? That's Lemmy, <laughs> motorhead for life. Anyway, mm -hmm. Lemma. So Lemma means membrane or wrapping, right? Remember that, uh, that, that the Lemma of a grain is the, like the husk for the outside, the membrane, right? And Lemma means sheep. So um, 
So where is the sarco lemma? Describe where I'd find the sarco lemma, the sheath or wrapping of the muscle fiber or the sarcomere. Where would I find that? Or what's it look like? Describe it in this, what's it look like in this drawing? Sarcolemma. Surrounds the, the, uh, the muscle fiber, right? So. Surrounds, yeah, yeah. It's surrounding the big object. It's on the outside. It surrounds the cell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and what is the cell itself called, Josh? Now that you're like... The cell itself? Yeah, the cell itself. So the sarcolemma is the lemma of the sarco, the wrapping of the sarco. So what is the cell itself called? Sarcomere. Sarcomere, yes, very good. Good Josh. Uh, oh, yeah, this doesn't work. Okay, now uh, what about, um, So we did fibrils versus fibers versus filaments. We did lemma versus mirror. This is good enough. Okay, so, um, all right. So if the word, excuse me. Uh, I'm not sure why this is not cooperating. So we'll just do that. So, oh, crap. All right, so if the word, um, I just, I just had this, this is, this is good. okay, eccentric and concentric. So eccentric means away from the center, especially if, if a movement is centripetal or round. Right, so concentric, hopefully you can see this because I'm drawing in the air. Concentric goes around and the circles get smaller with each pass and the line starts to move toward the center. Eccentric would be the opposite way where the circles get bigger moving out away from the center, right? So that's one definition of concentric and eccentric. Another definition of eccentric as in away from the center is um, in like mental behavioral terms, like unknown or not normal or unusual or weird, right? Uh, mm -hmm. In terms of muscles, away from the center would mean the opposite direction that the muscle moves. Right, so um, I'm not gonna try to connect the word center and contraction or center and muscle or anything like that. But uh, think of the eccentric movement as the direction that the muscle does not move the limb. So the main purpose of the bicep is to flex the, the elbow, bring the forearm closer to the center or bringing the forearm closer to uh, the humerus, right? And if you go the opposite way, that is not the movement that the biceps does. The purpose of the tricep is to open or take the forearm away from the humerus. So if you go the opposite direction, that's eccentric. That's not the contraction, not the direction that the tricep takes the limb, right? So the eccentric movement for, for the bicep would be extending the elbow and the eccentric movement for the tricep would be flexing the elbow joint and the concentric movement for the tricep would be extending the elbow and the concentric for the bicep would be flexing the elbow okay now let's get busy so for the flexors in the front and the extensors in the back of the neck which one is moving in an eccentric way when I lower my chin from a seated upright position? Which one is moving in an eccentric way? The back of your neck. 
Yes, can you use the, the word flexors or extensors, please? Uh, extenders. Extensors. Extensors. Now you get double thumbs up. Excellent. Thank you, Chardet. And welcome. since you're here, Char and, and since you're here, Chardet, if I'm upright, if I'm upright and I'm looking up, which muscles are contracting eccentrically or moving eccentrically? Which ones, the flexors or the extensors, if I'm looking up? The flexors. That's right. OK, now if I'm laying down, um, let's say this is, this is my head or your client's, your client's head. This is the belly, the face. This is the head, right? And you have the person lifting the head into flexion like this. This is flexion of the head at the neck is the technical term. Where is the eccentric movement? Is it in the flexors or the extensors? The extensors. That's right. And if you have them lower the head down, where is the eccentric movement? Is it in the flexors or the extensors? The flexors. Right. And where is the concentric movement if you, if you raise the head? Um, in the flexors. Very good. If you have them turn over, their face is down in the cradle, right? They're face down, this is the belly, this is the face, and they lift their head. Where's the eccentric movement during the extension? In the, ooh, in the flexors? There's, very good. And the concentric movement in the, in the extension here is? In the extensors. In the extensors, yeah, very good. Very, very good. All right, uh, how about? hip flexors and glutes, all right? So if you have, if you have, um, wearing black is always good. <laughs> uh, so uh, if you have uh, flexion at the hip and then extension at the hip, uh, if you're looking at the, okay, if, if flexion at the hip and extension, extension at the hip, which side is contracting eccentrically and which side is contracting, which side is contracting eccentrically if I, Move my leg into flexion. Which side is doing the eccentric? Hip flexors or glutes? Glutes. That's right. And which side is doing the concentric? Hip flexors or glutes? Extensors. Hip sorry, flexors hip or flexors. glutes? Yes. Hip flexors. Yes. And then which side is doing the concentric contraction here? Hip flexor or glute? Glutes. Glutes, the glutes yeah. that's right. Yeah, and with extension like that, which one is doing the uh, eccentric contraction? The hip flexors. The hip flexor, that's right. Okay, so um, let's see. Let's do some of the phasic muscles. What's the definition of a phasic muscle? A muscle that works against gravity or a muscle that doesn't work against gravity? Can you repeat that question? I'm sorry. Yes. What's the definition of a phasic muscle? Is it a muscle that works against gravity or a muscle that doesn't work against gravity? Works against gravity? Mm, that's actually a postural muscle, right? So the upper, so the upper trap is a postural muscle. If you mm -hmm. want to pick something up from the floor, you're going to be using your upper traps for sure. Mm -hmm. Right, that load is moving against gravity. If you just want to like shrug your shoulders, technically speaking, your arms are a load and they're being moved against gravity. Mm -hmm. But the phasic muscles, the trapezius muscle has two phasic parts as well, which is the middle trapezius, which retracts the shoulder blades and the lower trapezius, which depresses the shoulder blades or opens the chest. Wow. So the phasic portion, the middle and up and lower trap, can you see that they don't move against gravity? They don't move objects against gravity? Yeah. Okay, and which one do you think, um, which one do you think if it becomes dysfunctional tends to become short and spasmed? The upper trap or the middle and lower trap? Which one becomes more short and spasmed if it becomes dysfunctional? <clears throat> the upper trap. That's right. And 
in becoming short and does the upper trap move objects against gravity or does it more move objects not against gravity move, instead move of saying against, not against yeah. gravity let's say maintain structure mm. it moves them against gravity right yeah okay and um, yeah and then the mid and lower trap uh, does that also become short and spasmed, or do they tend to become uh, longer and weaker? Longer and weaker. Yes, longer and weaker in terms of dysfunction. And again, their purpose is not to move against gravity, but to maintain structure or stability. You guys, go review those basic and postural muscles that's found in your... Um, You guys remember where that is? That's in the kinesiology thing right here. Okay. All right, let's see. Um, Okay, so you have uh, you have several planes. You have the sagittal plane, you have the frontal plane, and then you have the transverse plane. Uh, put them in alphabetical order for me first. Anybody? What comes first, frontal, transverse, or sagittal? Frontal, sagittal, then transverse. Frontal, sagittal, then transverse. Okay, and then you have. What are, what are some of the divisions like up, down, left, right, front, back? Can you give me those? Um, in order or? No. Um, in pair, just in pairs. Oh, front, like you said, front, back, left, yes. right, up, down. Yep, left, right, and then up, up down. down. Yeah. Up, down, okay. So, and put these in alphabetical order. Are these in alphabetical order already? Yes, they are. Yes, they are. Okay, great. So remember, write all this out. Right. right. So a frontal plane is one that divides the body into the front and back. So where would that go? Would it go across from one shoulder to the other through the center of the body? Or would it go from the chest to the back through the center of the body? Where would the frontal plane go? One shoulder to, one shoulder to the other. That's right, one shoulder to the other. And then sagittal dividing it into left and right, would that be the one that goes straight through, through from the chest to the back? Yeah. Yeah, and then transverse divides it into the top and the bottom. So this one is which plane? Dividing it into right. front and back. That's frontal. And this one is which plane? Dividing it into left and right. Sagittal. Letter, letter F for frontal, letter S for sagittal, and the last letter is T. So that's transverse dividing the body into top and bottom or superior, inferior, or up, down. Okay. Um, was anything, did you guys find anything to be like particularly confusing that we went over? Do you want to, to drill a few variations of any of the suffixes or prefixes or combining forms or anything like that? I Otherwise, we're going to move on. Yeah. I would like to still work with the suffixes and the, all of that, um, just to try to remember. So I don't need you to go deep in depth with it. Just like, well, you know what? Never mind. I can do that on my own time. Well, why don't, why don't we go through a few? Okay. Why don't we go through a few? Okay. Uh, suffix, 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 suffix. Okay. Um, how many suffix do we have? Like four, like seven slides or some six slides or something. Okay, so uh, 
I tried to pick out the ones that I thought were most relevant to you, but some are really relevant clinically for you guys. And you're definitely going to see these at some point on, on the exam because they're just unavoidable, like myalgia or arthralgia. So algae is a really important one to remember. Remember the suffix, always, always translate that first, always read that first. So that'd be pain in the joints, right? Pain, pain of the muscle, pain in the nerve. Uh, emia, as in blood. We talk all the time about, about blood increasing or an increase of blood or blood decreasing or a decrease of blood, where some massage techniques cause ischemia, a decrease in blood. I don't like the word deficiency. It sounds too much like anemia. Uh, and hyperemia as an increase in blood. Uh, and, and many do both. They do, for example, a decrease in blood first and an increase in blood later. Okay. Um, itis. You're definitely going to run into this for tendonitis. Neuritis. Bursitis. Oma, you will see oma as in hematoma for sure, like bruising under the skin. Well, bruising is under the skin. Hematoma, and then um, does anyone remember the name for bone bruise? Uh, bone bruise. Mm, I don't think so. Bone bruise. Close, close. Bone contusion. Contusion. Uh, I thought the, the word OMA was included in there. Uh, no, I guess not, or at least I'm not going to be able to find it efficiently. Um, how about um, uh, another place you'll see hematoma, not just under, under the skin, is uh, in the brain, right? So between the, the brain and the dura is called, this is just a common, common location, a subdural hematoma, uh, when a blood vessel in the space between the skull and the brain is damaged, and you see that quite a lot in, um, sorry guys, I don't know why this is not allowing me to, um, to move over to the side, move this over to the side, so you can see the whole thing. Um, okay, anyway, you know what guys, sometimes you just have to know like when to cut your losses, like when to abandon ship, like this isn't working, so just, you know. Uh, yeah, osis, you'll see it less commonly than, than itis, um, less commonly than itis, but it is a term to keep in mind for sure. Pathy, like disease condition, myopathy, a disease of the muscles, uh, cardiomyopathy, a disease of the heart muscle. Also, um, in terms of healing diseases, homeopathy, osteopathy, allopathy, allopathic, so a medical doctor, an MD, is an allopath. They practice allopathic medicine. Uh, a homeopathic doctor practices homeopathy. A DO, doctor of osteopathy, practices osteopathy. Notice only one of them has the word medicine in their title. Did you know it's illegal in many states for alternative medicine practitioners to use the word medicine? Like you can't say, complementary and alternative medicine. You can't say Chinese medicine. You're not supposed to say that. Mm. Ain't so that a B? You say, you say alternative medicine, but you don't, you don't put it, uh, you don't put it like on a legal document or you don't put it like a, uh, you don't put it like in the title of your of your business. You'll find all these like small ins and outs. It's really not a big deal, but there, there are times when it's okay for you to say, I practice alternative medicine. And there are times when you should not say the word medicine, right? Uh, like um, if you were to make up your own term, like um, 
like a professor of mine had a business called, uh, you know, like New York physical medicine practice. And technically that's against the law. Like you can't, you can't say um, like Chardet physical medicine or Chardet alternative medicine, right? Uh, because that's like a title that denotes a thing that you don't do. You don't practice medicine. We don't practice medicine. Uh, medicine is a term that is reserved for allopathic and osteopathic practitioners, ac according to the law, according to like the state and uh, the entity in the state that confers your licensure, which in which in my state, New York, is the State Department of Education, it's called. Uh, let's see. Okay, it's just kind of interesting, like the way that words are restricted for us or supposed to be restricted for us. And all of our textbooks, like the origins of the, of the knowledge do not agree with the regulatory bodies on that. I think that's interesting and important. Okay, and then there's um, gram and graphy, record and process of recording. And then scope and scopy. So scope is a, a, a visual exam or a visualization like a picture and scopy is the process of, of obtaining the picture. <laughs> also al is very important, r, airy, ick right, peritoneal, inguinal, pelvic, phronic, A-R-Y, like axillary, very important. We're gonna see that all the time. Um, A-B away, A-D toward, by, on, E-C-C for ek. Yeah, okay, I think that's good for now. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is go through a few of the uh, pathology. No, is it pathology I'm looking for? No, we're gonna do, um, do this other section. What I'm gonna do is go through, go through a few sections, uh, go through a few questions from Yugo Prep that are on this section. Um, I don't have it here. Okay, so we're gonna use this shoulder and arm, forearm and hand. Uh, Yugo Prep kind of organizes things in a way that's a little, little funny, a little weird. Uh, and so what I have to do is I have to just like go through sections, same with a, less so with AMTA, but, but still. Uh, so I can just go through the sections and find out uh, like which ones are useful for which sections of our work. Okay, which muscle originates at the lateral and in, at the lateral border and inferior angle of the scapula. So this is important because in, in regards to medical terminology, knowing your lateral from your medial will totally make or break this, right? Because the inferior angle of the scapula has more than one muscle attaching to it. Like it has part of the trapezius, the lower trapezius crosses over there. And it also has like the serratus anterior. Uh, but only one of them attaches to the lateral border of the scapula. Uh, and that's the teres, that's the teres major. Um, get this out of here. Relaxing muscles and decreasing hypertonicity is a reflexive effect of what kind of treatment technique? Uh, Swedish gymnastics, cross fiber friction, coarse vibration, or jostling and shaking, cross fiber friction. So keep in mind that um, we're, we're a little off topic. This isn't medical uh, medical vocabulary, but since the question's in front of us, let, let's deal with it. So uh, keep in mind that uh, every, every technique, every massage technique has uh, a mechanical or a direct like immediate effect that happens as a result of the hand on the body and they also have a reflexive effect, which is a result of the body's reaction to the technique. Sometimes the reflexive effect will happen later. 
And one of the effects of cross fiber friction that happens later is that it relaxes muscles. It doesn't relax muscles to the maximum effect right away. It takes a little bit of time for the muscle to start to release and let go. And that can happen even after the massage is done and decreasing hypertensity. That's this, almost the same as relaxing muscles. Uh, the mechanical or direct effects for cross fiber friction. These are always, these are important to review, like always good to review. They broaden and stretch the muscle tissue. Think about like a, like a muscle that's torn. If you broaden and stretch it, it's gonna, it's gonna become hypertonic. It's going to spasm. But a muscle that is simply tight and needs to be relaxed, uh, it'll relax the muscle and broaden it. Uh, it relax the muscle after it's broadened and stretched. Temporary ischemia, look at this word. So is and emia. So what does emia mean? It means blood. And what does isk mean? There's, and if you don't remember, just think about ischemia and hyperemia, right? So those two are opposites. Hyper means an excessive amount of, and isk means what? Hyperemia means a, a deficient, uh, means an excess of blood or a proliferation of blood, and ischemia means what? As the opposite to hyperemia? Low. Did you say low? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like low is fine. Hypo. That is fine. Yeah. Hypo, low, less, deficiency of. Yeah, that's completely fine. Uh, decrease. Yeah. And also immediately starts to decrease fascial adhe adhesions and increases muscle extensibility, the lengthening capacity of the muscles, and breaks up and reforms scar tissue. The reflexive effects of cross fiber fr friction include hyperemia, right? Hyper meaning a proliferation of blood flow. So you use cross fiber and you push the blood out or you occlude or decrease the blood. And then when you let go and stop the technique, because of the, the, the cross fiber action, the blood flow starts to proliferate. Hyperemia takes place afterwards. And relaxing muscle tissues and decreasing hypertonicity. And increasing circulation. Is increasing circulation, is that hyperemia or is it ischemia? Increasing circulation, is that hyperemia or ischemia? Hyper. Hyperemia, that's right. And if blood flow is occluded to some place, like let's say the heart, it's used a lot in terms of um, heart muscle being starved of blood, is that is that ischemia or is that hyperemia? Ischemia. Ischemia, that's right, yeah. Good guys, the, the better you know this, the easier it's gonna be. Um, okay, this thing is flaking out on me now. Give me a second to refresh. Um, yeah, I don't expect it to consistently, it's not like I, uh, pay for the service or anything. Okay. The lateral posterior levator scapula muscle has one bilateral action and four unilateral actions that it performs. Can you see that like, if you know bi and uni, lateral and posterior and anterior, that if you know these words a little bit more easily, that the question is less intimidating, easier for you to take in and process? I hope so. Lateral posterior levator scapula muscle has one bilateral action and four unilateral actions. What is the one bilateral action? So what's the one thing that the lateral posterior levator scapula does bilaterally? Does it rotate the head and neck? Does that look bilateral to you? Is it lateral flexion of the head and neck? Does that look bilateral? Is it flexion of the head and neck? Ooh, tricky one. That's, that's definitely bilateral. Or is it extension of the head and neck? Hmm. Yeah, so you know it's not rotation or lateral flexion because those are moving toward one side. Those are moving laterally. It could be said unilaterally, not bilaterally. What about flexion and extension? How do you differentiate between those other than the fact that the answer is marked? How do you differentiate between the levator scapula muscle doing flexion versus extension? Just the way it bends for me. 
the way it bends for you and the surface in which it's attached in, in which it sits, right? It's on the back surface. So it's going to move the head backward rather than forward. Okay, of the following groups, choose the glenohumeral lateral. Right. Yeah, of the following groups, choose the glenohumeral lateral and the medial rotators. Now, this is a poorly phrased question, but they but they're going to give you two section two two sets of muscles, and they want you to choose one for the lateral aspect, the lateral rotator, and one for the for the medial rotator. Um, so remember that lateral and medial, the first thing we have to do is figure out what lateral and medial mean. What does that mean, lateral and medial? Does that mean that in the glenohumeral joint that we're looking at the lateral part of the, of the bones versus the medial part of the bones? Or what does that mean? Anybody? Josh. So it's on the, uh, on the. So go ahead. Yeah. So look at these words glenohumeral, lateral, and medial rotators. Mm -hmm. So I'll slice some of this, some of this nonsense off so that we can feel like figure out what they're talking about. So forget about glenohumeral. Yeah, you know what lateral rotator. lateral rotators? Good, you put it together. Good. So lateral rotation means what? Rotation to the side. Rotation to the side. Yes. Of what bone? Uh, of what bone? Glenohumeral joint. Is it the? I mean. So the, is it the collarbone or the mm -hmm. uh, the head of uh, the uh, the head of the humerus? That's right. And how do you know it's the head of the humerus? From yeah. how do you know from the question? Because it says the humeral. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Of course. Because right. it says humeral. Yeah. Glino humeral lateral medial rotators. So, um, okay, is it the infraspinatus teres? It's the infraspinatus teres minor and medial rotators of the tissus dorsi and teres minor. So I want you guys to kind of decode the questions or decode the answers, but not necessarily, I don't want to take the time to like go through all four of these if you know what I mean. Um, I'm sorry, guys. Okay, what's another word for, for lateral rotation? Lurisa, what's another word for lateral lateral rotation? Lateral rotation. Uh, another word for the lateral in lateral rotation. Medial? No. Medial toward the midline, lateral toward mm -hmm. the side. Uh, so another word for toward the side or away from the midline is what? Away from the midline is going to be a b duction. Very, very good thinking. I like it a lot. And that is correct. But usually we say external rotation, uh, lateral rotation, medial rotation, internal rotation. And for the movement of the shoulder, which one would be, which one would be a b duction? Would it be this way? Remember, when we talk about abduction, we're conducting away from the center. Would mm -hmm. it be this way or would it be this way? Would it be this way, like, um, like uh, putting your arm up on a bench? Or would it be this way, like putting your jacket on? OK, can you repeat that question? I'm sorry. Which one is abducting away from the center? Oh, is it okay. this way, like putting your shoulder up, putting your arm up on something? Or is it this way, like putting your jacket on? This putting way? your arm up on like a bench. That's right. 
Yeah. Okay. The bony landmark on the humerus that houses the forearm extensors. The bony landmark on the humerus that houses the forearm extensors. So I want you guys to look at your forearm and tell me where are the extensors? They're the ones that extend the what? They extend the elbow and forearm or the ones that extend the wrist? Mm -hmm. Elbow and forearm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, that's right. The forearm, the forearm extensors. Wait a minute, let me think about this here. Sharday may be correct. Forearm mm -hmm. extensors. Uh, so forearm extensors. I know I think they are the wrist extensors. Yes, they are the wrist extensors. Okay. Uh, and so the forearm extensors they extend the wrist they're the extensors in the forearm that act on the wrist and are they on the let's say dorsal surface or are they on the ventral surface dorsal dorsal surface that's right so if they're on the dorsal surface of the humerus or dorsal surface of the forearm would they attach to the lateral aspect now you got it like really twist your mind because i'm showing to you this way and this is anatomical so is it the lateral part of the humerus or the medial part of the humerus mm. so go like this yes go like this if you're confused touch the extensors of the forearm and then go in, um, and then keep your keep your hand here as you go into anatomical position, mm -hmm. and you'll see that this is lateral. I hope this is medial. So it's the okay. lateral supracondylar ridge. Maybe I'll give you some bony landmarks for next time, or maybe I'll just put some in there and hopefully you guys will study it on your own. It's just mm -hmm. like with the words stuff, like it's the foundation is so broad. There's so much time involved in, in it. It's totally doable, but it's just a lot. So a condyle is a bony landmark. It's a, an aspect of the bone. It's where it's where the bone goes like this. Condyle, okay. Let's keep going. Uh, here's another one. Temporary ischemia. God damn. Fuck. I'll edit that out. Uh, okay. Okay, time for one more question. Let me pick a good one. Marcos. Yes. Uh, I can't see this. It's still not letting me pull it up. So um, in terms of... Uh, in terms of like legal liability, let's say that um, there's a question on the test about uh, the intention to do harm. And mm -hmm. the question asks about non maleficence. Does this word non maleficence, does it indicate the intention to do harm or the intention not to do harm? The intention to do harm. Mm. Oh, no malfiance. I'm sorry. No, no. The non means no mal, no harm. Uh, yeah, yeah. So if we that's break it right. Up, yeah, that's yes. Non means no and mal means harm. Okay. And yeah. then how about um, um, let's do one more. Let's do. Um, Okay, here's a word, uh, physis, which means um, the bottom, which means the skull, yes. skull. Okay, or the, or it doesn't mean the skull. I'm sorry, it means the brain. Um, of physis. 
Spices. Um, okay. Take my word for it this time. It means brain. Okay. And then uh, there's a there's something called the hypophysis. So that means the bottom of the brain. And the area at the bottom of, of the brain is referred to as hypophyseal. And if you look at the hypothesis, maybe I'm spelling it wrong. Hypophysis, yeah, hypophysis, base of the brain, bottom of the brain. This is also the pituitary gland. Uh, I do not have a good image, but it doesn't matter. Okay, so the pituitary gland right? Mm -hmm. And pertaining, AL, pertaining to, right? Pertaining to the pituitary gland, right? And then um, uh, there's one more thing that I wanted you to know, which is the neuro and the adenohypophyseal. Okay. And then re recall that the, that the, that the, the, the uh, pituitary gland, the hypothesis has two parts. It has a front part and a back part. And the front part is composed um, of um, glandular tissue. That's also called adena, adena. And so it's referred to as the ade adeno hypothesis. So that is the section of the pituitary gland, which is made up of glandular tissue, like an adenoid. And then the back section is made up of mostly neuronal tissue. And that's called the neuro hypothesis, the pituitary gland that's made up mostly of neuronal tissue. So um, yeah, so I hope that helps. Uh, that's like kind of overwhelming, confusing words to see at one time. All right, guys, um, I'm going to fill this out and put together a little a little like quiz that you can take over a video. Uh, so you sit with the video and you and you answer the questions and the questions will be right here, just like we were drilling tonight, uh, just to, to try to round out medical terminology. And I have a request and that is that after you take the NBLEX, if there's medical terminology that we covered here that that seems like totally way off like irrelevant mm -hmm. please let me know or if there's terminology that showed up like in a big way that uh, was not covered i'd like to know that too because it is so vast so uh all right guys always great to work with you i'll see you on monday if you'd like a pdf copy of the presentation i use in this lecture or video please sign up for my newsletter. You can do that by going to my website, compassionatelearning.net, or sending me a message through Instagram, which is at compassionate learning. <laughs> oh, that is pretty clever. That's <laughs> pretty clever. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, what else? Um, also, if you sign up for my newsletter, you'll be notified of all the goodies that I offer to help you pass the MBLEX exam, including my $5 prep class, which I'll be offering once a month. Um, and there's also lots of other announcements that will be happening through the newsletter. Thanks for your time.